You're listening to the Brilliant Breakthrough Podcast, episode number 12 with Susan White. Welcome back, small business owners. I'm your host, Jake Naraki, and thank you for joining the Brilliant Breakthrough Podcast. If you don't know by now, we were recently ranked number one in two categories, entrepreneurship and small business. So thank you all who bought the book and participated in our launch for the Brilliant Breakthroughs for the Small Business Owner. This book is designed to help you, the small business owner, succeed in the 21st century. If this is your first time listening, head on over to Amazon and pick up the book, Brilliant Breakthroughs for the Small Business Owner. You will glad, you'll be glad you did. That's all I'm going to say with that. This podcast is designed for you, the listener, to understand a little bit deeper, to get to know the the authors that were part of this book. This book is packed with a lot of goodies to make sure that all of us succeed in the 21st century. And like Maggie, Maggie is the individual that brought together these co-authors in this awesome annual book series. Um, she wanted to make sure that these individuals that are part of the book are brilliant practicing experts. And what does that mean is basically what they're preaching is what they're doing in their small business to make sure they're executing the awesomeness in their small business. So today we have a great guest. She is a co-author of part of this book. Her name is Susan White. Susan is part of the uh, peace chapter, or I should say the peace pillar. And this book has four different kind of pillars that we're going to talk about. Profitability, people, productivity, and peace. And it's kind of a big pill to swallow when you say you need to find peace in your business. But it wasn't until I talked with Susan that kind of gave me some clarity in the 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 ideas of understanding who we are in relation to our business and of course all the other craziness that goes on in our lives that can affect the outcome of our business. So with that being said, I don't want to take any more time away from this great interview with Susan. Please sit back, enjoy the interview, and we'll catch you on the backside. Hey guys, welcome back. Today we have on another co-author of the Brilliant Breakthroughs book. Uh, Her name is Susan White. Her chapter is called Hope Out of the Shadows and Into the Light. I can say this now because uh, this is later on after the official launch of the book. This book, Brilliant Breakthroughs for the Small Business Owner, truly was and did take the number one spot in entrepreneurship and small business. So Susan, congratulations first right off the bat. Thank you. Well, Isn't it exciting? It is. It is. Obviously, we're a bit part of a big team here, a lot of great individuals. And, uh, you know, this podcast is, you know, to go hand in hand with those uh, people that, A, have not heard about the book, but also, too, want a little deeper knowledge and, and of course, connection with you um, about who you are and what you're about and, of course, your chapter. But before we get into the chapter, uh, enlighten us of uh, your background, where, where, where you're at currently, and uh, what you're up to. Well, I am a best-selling author. <laughs> I'm getting used to saying that. That's something new that I'm I'm adding to my repertoire. Um, professionally, I am a licensed clinic clinical social worker and a um, integrative life coach. So those are my two official uh, professions. As a human being, I'm um, a transformational hope merchant. That's a mouthful, isn't it? It is. I don't even know if I can repeat that, to be honest with you. Um, Transitional Hope Merchant. There's actually a section in my chapter where I refer to being in a college class and having a professor refer to me as a hope merchant and how it, it impacted me. It actually got me very flustered and frustrated when that happened because I, I found it daunting. But now I say it. Mm, a lot easier. Hmm. Well, like they say, the things that happen to us are part of our journey, and we can pick pieces that we want to relive. And obviously, you uh, in that moment was not ideal, but um, you're using it to your advantage today as a best-selling author. That's for sure. Right. Take us. Uh, I guess you, you brought it up. Might as well dive into it. Why uh, did he say that, and, and why did it affect you in a negative way at that at that time? Well. The whole title here, Hope, Out of the Shadows and Into the Light, I I need to talk about first hope as an abstract concept. And so frequently 
people talk about hope as though it's the be all and the end all, whereas hope is actually just a feeling or an expectation or a desire for something to happen. But one of the things that fascinates me so about hope is that people attach this concrete belief system around hope. And hope only has real value if it's it's turned into an action. So that was my fascination with the whole notion of hope. When When the professor said to me that I was going to be a hope merchant, immediately I became very frightened because how am I going to be a hope merchant for somebody, somebody else that's made a mess out of their life through the choices they've made? How am I going to be a hope merchant for somebody who's unwilling to take the actions that they need to take? And those are all shadow aspects. I bet you want to know what a shadow is, don't you? Uh, yeah, uh, you're reading my mind. <laughs> So a shadow aspect is a disowned quality of ourselves. For example, um, we all have this container within ourselves for thoughts and feelings and qualities that we don't like or that we want to hide from others or suppress. So some examples of shadow qualities And sometimes they can be emotions or sometimes they can be actual personality type qualities. Um, For example, some of the emotions might be uh, fear, frustration, Uh, qualities could be meanness, rudeness, uh, even sarcasm, which is so prevalent today. But um, getting back to shadows... um, we've learned that these qualities are are bad or wrong or undesirable. And the truth is that all of these qualities have value. And in learning about our shadow qualities, we can actually harness those qualities and use them. Hmm. Interesting. When you lay this on individuals, um, how do they respond? Typically with denial. Because most people don't want to take a look at that part of them that is, um, for example, rude. Who sure. wants to be rude? Right. None of us learn to be rude as we're growing up. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. We're told, don't be rude. However, when we're faced with a deadline and we have to manage our time, it might be very valuable for us to be rude and say, I have to stop right now and I have to end whatever's going on with this conversation and move on. And somebody might take that as being very rude because they don't feel completely heard. But being rude in that particular instance helps us maintain a schedule and limits and boundaries. Yeah, interesting. I can see the denial aspect. Um, one thing you said a couple seconds ago was the sarcasm, right? That was a emotion that you brought up that we use a lot today. Is that correct? Correct. And mm-hmm. I guess what? Why is it that we use it more today than before? And is it good or is it a bad trait to have? Well, sarcasm is an interesting quality because it typically has a hint of anger at it in within it. And who who wants to walk around saying I'm angry, I'm angry, I'm angry, but if we lighten it up and we make a joke out of it, well isn't it funny? True. Very true. We could list a multitude of comedians that that entertain us by being sarcastic. So it's a very it's a very easy way to mask our anger as opposed to taking a look at anger as a shadow quality and realizing that anger has value. For example, if I bring my car into a mechanic to be fixed and it's not fixed and I bring it back a second time and it's still not fixed, do you suppose that anger might be beneficial at right. that point right. to get my to get my point across to the the mechanic? Yes, most definitely. Yeah, so we get to use our anger as opposed to using us. 
and having temper outbursts that have absolutely no value and just um, debilitate and hurt people. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, the, you know, the the plus. I, I first as a disclaimer here, uh, you're part of the peace chapter, so this conversation is in alignment with one of the four pillars. We have profitability, we have people, we have productivity, and then, of course, peace. And this conversation, obviously, is going to kind of adapt into how we can bring more peace into our business and, of course, be more, I guess, maybe happier or joyful um, through our journey of our small business. But for the time right now, uh, you know, the great thing about hosting a podcast is that you're able, I am able to dive a little bit deeper with you in different facets than, than let's say, just reading it you know, on the book itself. And so I kind of want to investigate the sarcasm a little bit because, number one, I look, I, correction, you know, I work in a field of a lot of alpha males and sarcasm is very prevalent. Um, oh. it's, it's, a, it's used all the time. And mm-hmm. I find myself using sarcasm a lot at home with my wife or my kids. And I think it's in a joking manner. But it's funny, as soon as you said it's a hint or, you know, disguising it as anger, but, you know, I, I kind of laughed at that because I it's very true. It's like um, it's like the classic of, you know, somebody helping you in the kitchen. They say, do you want these, uh, you know, grapes to go in the fruit salad? Or, and you're like, no, I want you to put it with the casserole. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, like, a, like a classic, you know, like joke like that. But that's truly like anger. Like how silly are you? How stupid are you uh, to uh, think what, like that, right? Question, right? What's, what's that? Say that one more time. Duh, what a dumb question. Right, exactly, exactly, exactly. So Which I, would be a better quality, by the way, dumb. Who wants to be dumb? True, very true. So I guess my question is when you open this door to the person like myself or my other coworkers or people that are listening in right now, how do we digest that? How do we learn from it? Or do we just take it as part of who we are and make sure we control it instead of lash out? Or how do we navigate that? Well, it is a part of who all of us are, including myself. And I had the good fortune of of, uh, learning and studying with uh, Debbie Ford, the remarkable late Debbie Ford, who wrote Dark Side of the Light Chasers. And I learned so much about her, uh, from her about the shadow. She was the queen of shadow work. She wrote, oh, I don't know how many bestsellers, 10, 11, 12 bestsellers about shadow work. Um, Basically, to answer your question, each and every quality that we possess has value. And that is what I go back to in this, this uh, chapter that I wrote because I identify hope as an abstract quality and the person that I wrote the chapter about had all this hope but yet never took a look at his shadow qualities and how it pulled him under and actually damaged his business. So had he been able to look at some of his shadow qualities like um, overconfidence when when he y- allowed his confidence to use him to excess and he became c- actually cocky, it it pulled him under because he wasn't he wasn't using it to enhance himself. Did I answer your question, or did I it, go off on no, tangent? No, no, no. I think I think it's a good segue into um, into kind of I guess using your your character in the story as an example of of exactly I guess what we're kind of unfolding here step by step. And mm-hmm. you, you name this individual uh, Steve, right? Steve is is embarking, and he's a baker, and he has a bakery. Do you, please share that story with Steve, and I guess we can use some of our conversation as um, different highlights. Uh, through the unraveling of Steve's business? Well, Steve follows his dream, and he opens a bakery called Cups and Cakes, and, and it's successful, and and he's he's just rolling along and, and living the dream of having his own bakery, and then a big bakery moves into town, and they have 
six different locations. They're very well known. And Steve has more of a mom and pop operation that's doing very well. But he becomes so overconfident and cocky that nobody can touch him that he actually does not take a look at this competition that is much more established than he is. And people flock to his competition and he doesn't recreate himself. He just thinks that he's going to be fine. He hopes that everything will work out. And hope is an abstraction. Hope is an abstraction. Mm-hmm. It needs to be turned into something concrete. It needs to be attached to an action in order to be valuable. Again, hope is an expectation that something is going to happen. If we don't take action, then nothing ever happens. Yeah. Now, so ultimately, he then closing his doors. Because he doesn't adapt and change, which is so important when you're in business. And obviously, you work with people from all different backgrounds on all different types of issues. Um, is this an obvious issue? You know, is is do people come to you for relationships or other things, and it stems from the business? aspect. You know, I'm just I'm just trying to look uh, it may not apply to exactly what we we're just talking about, but I just feel like, you know, obviously you have a very uh, you know, a, a great background with a lot of knowledge. You've worked with a lot a lot of people throughout the years in assisting them get through different obstacles in their lives. And mm-hmm. I would imagine through conversation you pull out different ideas or you see things in a different way that you can bring up to that individual and then they go, oh, you know, the classic, oh, yeah, okay, I never thought of it like that. Is is this one of those moments? Is is this example like a real life kind of thing or? Most definitely. Okay. You know, big business has uh, industrial psychology on its side. Small business doesn't have that. And so often people in business don't stop to think that they may be standing in their own way. Hmm. And that's where the peace aspect comes in. If we work to develop ourselves, if we work to grow ourselves, if we evolve into being who and what we need to be within our business, that's going to develop a sense of peace within us. Yeah, true. Yeah, valid, valid on that uh, forefront. With the peace, it is very hard for people to digest that right here, right now, depending on where they're at in the level of their business. Is this a, you being a part of this pillar, is this more of a reminder, more of a warning sign, more of a good to know kind of peace in the journey of a person that is doing well in their business, um, just to be mindful of, I guess, where do you see this fitting into the, the individual that's currently in their business right now? Yes, yes, and yes to all of those questions. Um, my personal belief is that we have a duty to evolve and transform as human beings because that's what life is all about. Yesterday is gone, and tomorrow is just something that we anticipate. And with each new day that we live, we all encounter new and different aspects of life. So what I do is I help people transform their lives as life happens. For example, you're a new father, right? Uh, For the third time. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, yeah. But new new father uh, for 2017, yes. So you have a baby in the house, and that changes everything yep. again. Right. So you transform in order to manage. Congratulations, by the way. You transform in order to manage that change within your house. And it will change again as your children continue to grow and you learn about what being a parent is to three little boys. True. That is true. And that that doesn't happen in a vacuum for you. We all experience that. Right, right, right. 
and when you put it in that uh, frame of reference, that's obvious. Like, yeah, of course I'm going to change and adapt and, <laughs> and conversations and everything are going to change because, right, you see the, the growth of the child. But, um, you know, it brings up a good reminder that in our business, depending on what your product or service is, it can feel very stagnant, you know, not growing or continuing to develop because it's a it's true and and well in in your mindset but like the example that you shared with Steve that he was very uh one-sided in his perspective um mm-hmm. when you when you work with people is perspective something that you want to bring out you want to show them the other side of the coin does it happen naturally or is it something that you you kind of guide that person to Well, I guide people to try and find out what it is that they want for themselves. There's a a word that's crucial in the work I do, and that word is willing. So frequently I I will uncover what somebody wants, and they are not willing to do what it takes to get what they say they want. Sometimes in my work I uncover something called underlying commitments. So think about that. I can say I'm committed to uh, exercise. And in the morning when the alarm goes off, I may actually have an underlying commitment to sleep a little later and want to hit the news. (laughs) What? Does that sound familiar? No. (laughs) What is that? What is that called? Underlining commitments? An underlying commitment. So sometimes people say, I want this, this, and this, but the truth is that they aren't willing to do what it takes in order to have what they say they want because there's an underlying commitment. Very often that happens in business. How often are we in business for ourselves and we've put in our 8, 10, 12, however many hours we've put in And there's still more to do, and we have deadlines to meet. We don't have the luxury of saying, oh, I'm tired, or I don't feel like it. We still have to plug away. True. You know, as myself in the personal development space, um, you know, in this book, I'm helping individuals create podcasts, but, you know, my, my real... Uh, passion to go and serve is to help people, you know, kind of take control of the nine inches or six inches between their ears. And the reason why I kind of had to do do a, do a double take on that term is because that is a real, um, I don't know if it's a real problem, but it's something that a lot of people deal with yearly, especially come January 1st, uh, when it is time to make those commitments and those people don't fulfill them because like you said, they are more committed to um, sleeping or resting or relaxing or hanging out or whatever the case may be. Um, how how does one break through that? <laughs> I guess I'm looking for the golden nugget here. I know there's probably no one answer or one trick pony here to that to that. Uh, that comment, but I'm just curious, how do we, we understand the term, we know the definition of it, how do we get through it? By telling the truth. Okay. One, the, once you realize that you say you want one thing, but you're doing everything that you can to sabotage that one thing, because you really have an underlying commitment to something else, then it's time to tell the truth, isn't it? It is, yeah, totally. And once you actually tell the truth and reveal what's important to you, whether it's that thing you say you want or that underlying commitment you have, and usually underlying commitments have to do with comfort, ease, or knowing what's familiar. We do what's familiar and what's comfortable to us, don't we? 100%. Mm -hmm. So breaking out of that will get us sometimes what we say we want, which is usually above and beyond what we're familiar with and what we're comfortable with. Hmm. Um, I I think we could talk about this for a very long time, but I guess how do we become more truthful 
to ourselves. I mean, this relates to everything from business to health to well-being to relationships to your traditional job, if, if you have one or whatever the case may be. How do you, how do you bring out that truth? Well, you can hire a wonderful therapist that's a <laughs> listener. Do you know of anybody? <laughs> I actually um, do. I'm very familiar with somebody. That's, that's one of the things that's very challenging about the work that I do because many times I have to tell the truth and I have to do it in a way that is, um, that is, is palatable or will not uh, be a deterrent to somebody because the truth can be harsh. I actually sat with somebody who was very harsh this morning and, and telling the truth to his daughter as she cried, and uh, that that wasn't too effective, which was the truth that I had to share with him. Sure, sure. How, how do you cope with that personally? I mean, that's your line of work. That's your business. How do you know, I mean, how do you get through those moments when the truth hurts, you know you need to say it, but yet, you know, like it's, it's, it's going to be difficult for you. There's going to be a lot of repercussions of anger and, you know, and hate from that individual. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, I realize that any contempt that's projected onto me because I've identified and shared the truth that's going on, I realize that that's not about me. That's about the person that is contemptuous. Huh. That's another shadow piece as well. When, when you begin to learn about your shadows, you can recognize them in other people. Somebody else's thoughts and feelings are not mine. And I'm able to separate myself from that and actually allow them to be with their own thoughts and feelings, and that's, that's trained into us. That's trained into a good therapist. Mm. Yeah, good for you. Um, it's, it sounds like it's amazing work, obviously, because you're able to assist people through the journey, um, but also, too, they're, I mean, you've done this long enough that you kind of separated yourself uh, just using you know, the, the terms that you just uh, referred to. Uh, to right. let us know that you know it, it's it's their emotions, it's their feelings. It's not directed to you, your personality, who you are as a human. Um, which I could see it would be tough in the beginning for a new individual in that line of work. But uh, um, yeah, regardless, um, obviously you you know your stuff, and and uh, and it's great to be talking with you. I guess the question I have is when Maggie chose um, or offered this to you for the peace section of this book. Did this story pop to mind first? You know, what, what were some other ideas floating around that you felt that was needed in the world of bringing peace to small business owners? I, I actually only thought about hope. And at the time, I recall that there were several people I was, I was working with at the time who would refer to hope. And even even now, today, it's very common for people to just talk about hope, like it's some magical wand that somebody's going to wave and everything's going to be fine. So hope is just this internal expectation that we have. Unless we take action, it doesn't have much value other than just the expectation. So I really didn't think about anything else except hope in this particular um, instance. Now, this is an annual publication, right? and I am thinking about next year, though, and I've got lots of ideas for next year, which I'm still going to keep under wrap. <laughs> keep us guessing for a whole year, year, year here. Um, I guess my question is, what is the difference between hope and belief? Um, in the personal development world, belief is a little more powerful in the term mm -hmm. of hope. Um, I guess maybe you could d demystify that or uh, throw some knowledge at it. What, what's your suggestion on it? Well, that, that is a great question. And the distinction between hope and belief, both of them are abstract. However, belief is something that is mine. I own it. Hmm.
hope is an expectation of something that doesn't really exist, um, except in my imagination. Debbie Ford used to say, knowing is the booby prize. So take that in for a minute. Knowing is the booby prize. So if I have a belief that um, I need to take a certain action or I need to go through a certain sequence of events um, under a particular situation, I may or may not have to do that and I may be making my life a lot more difficult than it needs to be. I know that that's what I do, but it might not necessarily have to be that way. Knowing is the booby prize. When I receive a new idea, a new concept, a new possibility, it's up to me then to make a decision if my belief is serving me or if my belief is limiting me. Hmm. Yeah, no, valid uh, statement on both, and I appreciate you uh, showing us the difference between the two. Um, I would assume that through conversations with individuals that there are major decision resentment from people that choose to go left instead of right or right instead of left or up or down or whatever the case may be in their business relationships. When you take them through uh, you know, your, your different talking techniques, are decisions one of those things that people fall back on as, as I should not have done that, I should have done this? Is that something where individuals or businesses or just people of the world um, kind of always stumble upon when we are faced with decisions that could either raise us up or, or push us down? Well, decision resentment sounds like a new psychological term, and I've never heard that. So yeah, I just made, I just yeah, I just made that up. So feel free to uh, pay me a nickel every time you say it now. <laughs> okay. um, you know, p- people do look at shoulds or should nots, and again, going back to that whole notion of I know or I don't know. People people put a lot of uh, weight on knowing, and lots of times we don't need to do that. Um, I don't really need to know why I hit the snooze button in the morning when I'm saying that I want to exercise. I just need to stop hitting the snooze button. Right. I should get up to exercise. So all those words... They're simply words, and and it's the meaning that we attach to those different words. We can get real caught up in in, uh, analysis paralysis, and I don't really like to do that, and I like to pull people out of that place because we're a very cerebral society. And if we think about, if we think about, listen to that, um, All the analysis that we do, people are very out of touch with their emotions for the most part because emotional um, health is really not rewarded. It's the thought process, the educational process that's rewarded. But what I zero in on are these parts of ourselves that are emotional. Emotional parts like afraid, frustrated, overwhelmed, anxious, stressed. Those are just a few I have off the top of my head. Did I go off on a tangent again, or did I respond to your question? No, no, you responded. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm just, as, as you continue to talk, and you're, you're throwing a lot of knowledge in the world of, you know, kind of mental health and clarity and all those things, and I'm just thinking, like, how do you find your own personal clarity? You know what I mean? Do you seek assistance from some of your mentors or, or principles that you, you help other people get through? Because I can only imagine that, you know, you're still human, you know, you, you're still going, you're, you're building out your business, you're building out your life and, and you're in your relationships and, and you're, you're sitting down and taking a lot of time and diving into other people's lives where where do you kind of pause and reflect on you 
and get back to your center of gravity? Well, a couple different areas. One, I have a terrific husband, a terrific dog, and a terrific therapist. And I rely on them in different orders depending on what my needs are. <laughs> Fair enough. So, so does the dog usually come first as a as a debriefing, and then you dive in, or who who usually comes first? Actually, the dog comes to work with me every day. Oh, okay. Every day have around. She's a therapy dog. Okay. Well, then, perfect. Perfect. So people look forward to actually. I mean, sometimes I think they come to see the dog, and I'm just a byproduct. <laughs> hey, whatever pulls out good conversation, right? Right. Um, how the second idea is recently through my personal work, we've been talking about uh, different issues that are rising with just human nature, with work and, and dynamics. And the one thing that was brought up is how to start a conversation um, in the world of where people are holding in things that they know they should be talking about. And you know, as a Male, I think we have a different, more of a difficult time expressing, expressing or talking through problems or scenarios in our mind. And a lot of small business owners are listening, and they've been there. They are dealing with, you know, the decision making or the wrong decision or new opportunity or you know, should they lower the price or raise the price and all these different things that they choose not to discuss in the open because they feel it should be internal talk or internal chatter. But yet when the the husband or wife decides to say, hey, what are you thinking about or what, what can you share with me today, instead of opening up, we, we are safeguarding it. We're closed off to it. How mm-hmm. do we get good at starting a conversation when we feel it should be an internal chatter instead of a conversation? Mm. Sometimes we aren't good at it. Sometimes we start it poorly okay. and a good listener will pull out the information by acknowledging what the listener thinks they hear. You know, acknowledgement is self-correcting. If I hear you saying something and I can acknowledge that you sound confused and you are confused, then you feel heard. If you aren't confused, but you're actually more curious, it's self-correcting because you tell me, You know, I'm not as confused as I am curious. Hmm. So that's how the conversation actually begins. And again, it doesn't always begin good. It becomes, sometimes it begins poorly. And that's a huge part of the um, discomfort of having the conversation. Right, right. Yeah, and, and it's like anything. I mean, conversation is such a unique dynamic that there is no one way to do anything, especially in the world of pulling out different things out of people's minds or emotions. Uh, it's tough. It, it's it's a very tough conversation. Um, what was the one thing that you really wanted to bring out in this chapter? Obviously, hope was the, the recurring theme and obviously was involved in your title. But what was there any other subliminal messages or underlining messages that you felt that that hopefully the reader could grasp out of your chapter in particular? Anybody who has their own business is unique in that they are entrepreneurial, and just because they are independent and entrepreneurial doesn't mean that they don't need to do some soul searching with another human being that can give them feedback and help them reveal aspects of themselves. So that's what I was thinking about in terms of this particular chapter. Again, I have a real fascination with hope and I want to introduce everybody and anybody to the concept of the shadow because it's so prevalent and it does damage if we don't learn about the shadow and we don't start to understand that disowned aspects of ourselves are responsible for the disastrous news that we hear and we shudder at. How can we find more information on the shadow? I would imagine that not all therapists 
maybe hit on this as well as you do, correct? Because each therapist has their own style and unique dynamic. Would, is that true? That's correct. Okay. Well, um, again, Debbie Ford has written many books about shadow work, and I would highly recommend, um, most importantly, Dark Side of the Light Chasers is an excellent book to learn about the shadow. Um, Googling the shadow would give you information about it. And, of course, you can call or come see me, and I would be thrilled to uncover your shadows. Well, hopefully we can go uh, right to the source, as in you, uh, to get the information to assist us in that uh, discovery. Um, kind of wrapping up here a little bit, but there's a lot of dynamic to what you do, uh, more dynamic than, say, a very tactical aspect of running a business. Um, you know, my chapter was on podcasting, very tactile, you know, start here and there and you're off to the races. Yours is, uh, you know, like the ocean, it's always flowing and moving and sometimes it's calm and sometimes it's irritable. Um, Mm -hmm. what is a reoccurring theme that people are kind of, you know, stumbling over or not being able to clear up on their own that you feel that, ah, man, you know, if, if you could, just kind of let a message out to the uh, to the world or you know to the audience that they can kind of self realize or self uh, mend or heal on their own could really benefit them where they're at today. Very large, loaded question <laughs> that that so I don't... <laughs> many things. I want to quote Stephen Covey, who has. Um... I learned from Stephen Covey's work that we need to be efficient with things and effective with people. Efficient with things, effective with people. And that is huge in the work that I do because so many people think that there's a one-size-fits-all in working with people, and there isn't. Everybody is individual, and they need to be addressed as an individual yeah. No, very true. And great quote to um, kind of knock that home. Um, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, I'm curious on, I guess it's one of those things as a outsider looking in, I want to know, am I, am I right? As in like, am I right in between the lines of a, a good person? You know, a person that, you know, has the obvious peaks and valleys of life of, hmm, you know, am I in that stable position or am I in the irritable station or whatever the case may be because chances are a lot of the people that are coming to you are in the very kind of their last ditch hope right I mean they're they're really they, they've done the self-diagnose they've probably done some research they've tried to you know talk to the the low-hanging fruit as in trying to you know get their bearings right but only until they sit down and really talk to you chances are they're really deep within whatever issue or ailment that they're trying to discuss with you. Is that true? Not, not always. Okay. That, that sounds, it sounds, it sounds desperate. That's the word that I heard desperate. And a lot of people will come to me, um, to, to get, a, a as a sounding board. Yeah as a sounding board, just to see if what they're doing makes sense. You know, when you were framing that question for me, it sounded like you were asking about being within the normal range. Right, right. Of being a human. Normal is a statistical term. Mm. I educate people about that all the time. Normal really has very little to do with being human, in my opinion. It, it's a statistical term, and it represent, is represented by a bell curve. Mm. Awesome. That's a really awesome answer because you're right. Mm-hmm. That is nothing more than just data collected on a sheet and right. uh, and it doesn't apply to the individual that is uh, living its life through uh, from start to finish. Um, awesome, Susan. Um, really, really good stuff. Um, I, I just laugh because it's like uh, one of those things that uh, I know you said you're, you know, you're a sounding board sometimes and it's like, yeah, I should... Uh, 
get in contact with you here and and, and clear up some of the, the the jargon that's going on in in my world. But um, you know, I appreciate you taking time to write out a a very nice, easy story for the audience to learn about Steve and and the the obvious destruction of his business in in very plain context. Because I can feel that sometimes uh, individuals in your field. Uh, get a little deep quick and you did a great job of allowing the reader to kind of slide into your your points and in, in your ideas which I thought was very inviting so uh, kudos to you and um, and yeah you're doing some amazing work out there um, any anything that I did not hit upon I mean the classic kind of uh, question interview thing is there anything that I forgot to ask or to say before we wrap up I can't think of anything. Okay, great. Well, hopefully I, I, that means I did my job at least. Um, yes. now, now for you, obviously this book is called Brilliant Breakthroughs uh, for the Small Business Owner. But for you personally, is there a big brilliant breakthrough in your life or your business that you'd like to share with us? Hmm. You know, they come to me so frequently through the people I work with that I can't even begin to um, zero in on one. And when I think about brilliant breakthroughs, heck, Jake, this is a brilliant breakthrough. I've never done a podcast before, so I'd say (laughs) it's one. Um, I don't think I've had the most brilliant breakthrough yet because I think it's yet to come. Right. Yeah, very, very well said. Uh, and to elaborate off of that, you know, I think uh, every moment is a brilliant breakthrough because it shows you something you didn't see before. So um, we always look for the big, uh, the big, you know, storm or firework display when just little things are are big enough in our own personal life. So, uh, Susan, thank you again for your time. How can people get in contact with you and find out all the great things that you're doing in the world? Um, call two two four. Five seven seven five zero two two, or you can go to my website, which is Life Skills Center dot com. Cool. Uh, again, this uh, information about Susan in her chapter. A little brief bio is in our free app. Head on over to the App Store uh, within your device and download the Brilliant Biz Book app. It's free, and you can get uh, all the great resources about the authors in that application. So, Susan, thank you again for being a part of this book. Uh, You brought uh, a lot of breakthroughs to me personally, and I know that a lot of individuals that are listening in – brought some clarity to them, you know, brought a different perspective than what uh, they were probably thinking in the world of the pillar of peace. And so uh, thank you for breaking that down and uh, putting it into pieces that we could digest easily. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Jake. Thanks again to Susan for coming on the show, and I can tell by the way that she presents, she would probably pull out a lot of great things out of myself in in conversation, I think which is good, because like I stated in that conversation somewhere, I talked about perspective, and perspective is nothing more than seeing things that you usually, usually don't see, and when you are in the trenches with your business, the last thing that you're looking for is A, peace in your business. Also, to reflection on what you're doing, you know, through sarcasm jokes or the way that you present yourself to different people. Um, Susan seems like an amazing individual to really just kind of let it all hang out, as they say. Um, so if you are interested in, in having a deeper conversation with Susan, make sure you rewind the interview, listen to her phone number, and get her on the phone. Talk to her and see if she's a right fit for you. Again, all the individuals that are part of this book are brilliant practicing experts. They're doing what they preach. And truly, all these individuals are here to cater to you guys to help you along your journey, your path. And if you want to get to know these authors or if you want to get to know us a little bit deeper, please head on over to your application folder within your phone and download our free app. All you have to do is type in Brilliant Biz Book, Brilliant Biz Book with capital Bs. Download that to your phone, tablet, computer, whatever it may be that fits your lifestyle. 
and get to know us on a deeper level. We'd love to support you in your personal journey because there is no way one individual can conquer their small business. It takes a small army, a small army, small army of brilliant practicing experts. And if you want us in your back pocket to help you along your journey, we'll be here for you. So with that being said, we appreciate your time. We'll catch you next week for another great episode of the Brilliant Breakthroughs podcast. And all we ask for you to do is please subscribe and leave a review for the show. It'd be great really appreciate it. And lastly, go out there in the world today and do something brilliant with your small business. We'll see you.